I have seen things you people wouldn't believe. <laughs> Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. I've watched sea beams glitter in the dark near the Tannhauser Gate. All these moments will be lost in time, like tears in rain. Time to die. These words by the dying replicant Roy Batty, spoken during the final section of Blade Runner, the 1982 Ridley Scott film, have become justly famous. They have an emotional impact which has lasted over the years and decades. I do have to say, Rutger Howard does a much better job of saying them than I ever did. Everyone was in tears, apparently, during the shoot when he was speaking these 42 words. Don't see anyone crying here, maybe <laughs> tears of laughter, but never mind. But scenes like this indicate the intense power of, um, of film, of cinema. It's the most revolutionary and widespread art form in history. One that is directly linked to the modern age, the age of capitalism, actually. One that has no precedent in history. No one in ancient Greece sat down on an evening to watch a film. They watch plays and stuff like that, musical performances, but no one said, ah, stick the film on that, so let's watch see what's on, you know. Oh, it's, it's Hercules again. It, it didn't happen. This is entirely something which is linked to the modern world and the modern age. Now, of course, all, all art has a relationship to technological and economic advances. For example, when oil paint replaced egg tempera in painting, it completely transformed the world of art. You know, it went from frescoes to actual paintings. But no change, no link has been more obvious than that of cinema and film and technology. You know, you do require a mechanical film camera, or at least a digital camera in the modern world, and then a projector. Without this, you cannot have cinema. It is therefore uniquely modern and is linked to the modern society in which we live in. Something else about cinema we need to think about. Paintings, classical music, statue, all the arts through the ages were all pretty much aimed at a very small elite audience, a group of patrons able to pay for the, the privilege of having these art forms. In fact, they often existed purely to glorify this or that uh, painting. If you go to the National Gallery, there's a marvellous painting of, uh, of uh, Jesus and his disciples in, entering Jerusalem. And on the side, there is the Medici family watching it. Historically impossible, of course, but when you pay the money, you get yourself in the picture. So art in the past has been very elite. It's been very isolated. Probably uh, <laughs> Beethoven's symphonies, as wonderful they are, were probably only heard by a couple of thousand people during his lifetime. But film is a mass form of art. Duplication of prints means it can be seen the same everywhere, in any part of the world, on any, um, in any cinema or whatever. Film exists in every part of the world. There's hardly a country, I think apart from Antarctica, which doesn't have a film industry, which doesn't have cinemas. It therefore brings to a mass audience in a completely new way the, the imagery of painting linked to the movement of linked to the movement of music. It's a completely live dialectical form of art. Above all, it's an art form that can reach and reflect the lives of the working class. You know, if you want to see the Mona Lisa, in the real Mona Lisa, you have to go to the Louvre in Paris. If you want to see a great film, you can, within reason, see anywhere in the world exactly the same, give or take quality uh, of the print. So that, I think, is the first thing to understand. Therefore, we have to understand that film has a dual character, both as an art form as in a mass form of, of entertainment. At its best, it's able to combine the two to stunning effect. The films of Kubrick, Kurosawa, Bergman, Truffaut, Lumet, Fellini, Fuller, Melville, Hitchcock at his best, Peckinpah, on and off, have all achieved this. To this, this list, I also add Sergio Leone and Mario Bava, 
we haven't got time to discuss that. Today we could add the films of Wes Anderson and of course Martin Scorsese in his prime. There are many others who have been able to produce stunning works of art that can be enjoyed by everybody. And that is the power uh, of film. The other thing that is important about film and about cinema in particular is that it's a shared experience. You know, when you can have one, it's capable of having a profound effect. You sit in the cinema, you laugh, cry, jump out of your seats, and you do it all uh, together. You know that scene in Jaws when the guy's swimming around and finding his uh, sunken boat, and he rips off a bit of the wood, and his decomposed face drops out at him. I remember seeing that in 1975 at the Paramount Cinema in the West End, and I've never seen it like it. It's everybody suddenly went, whoa, like that. And, yeah, and then everyone laughed, you know, because they felt a, a fool. That is a shared experience. It's, it's, to be honest, a film like George is not the same on the small screen, uh, and, and that's something we need to, uh, to, to be, bear in mind. Now, obviously, today's cinema is under threat. It's under threat as never before. I mean, uh, when I was growing up, we had 10 cinemas within a walking or a bus journey from where I lived. Three in Southgate, three in Enfield, one huge one in Edmonton, and three in Wood Green Turnpike Lane. All gone. So for many people, you cannot even see a film today in the cinema. It's impossible. There are no cinemas to actually go to. And of course, now we've got streaming and home video, which particularly with COVID having hit cinema very hard, these, the film companies have used this to push forward streaming home video, video on demand. Why? Because although it means cinemas lose a load of money, the film companies gain a lot, and they have gained a lot through this. So this is, if you like, you can see that in many ways cinema is, you know, is under attack now more than ever. The cash returns from streaming have simply made this a logic. They're fighting back, but it's not going to happen. But let's think about it. To really experience film, you need to see it in a cinema. That's where you really see the power. But think about it. The famous jump cut at, uh, early on in Lawrence Arabia from inside the smoky map room to the blazing red of the uh, desert. Stunning sequence, you know, which uh, can only be really enjoyed on a huge 70 millimeter uh, screening uh, film. The last half hour of 2001 A Space Odyssey on Cinerama, which I was lucky enough to see in 1968. You know, an experience I've never forgotten, and I've seen that film in the cinema about 25 times over the last uh, 30, 40, 50 years now, I suppose. Um, the deathly silence of the audience at the end of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. I don't know if anyone's seen that film. It really has a powerful emotional ending, but what really hit, I was in a big cinema, full Saturday night. Everyone got up and no one was talking. No one was saying a word. You could feel the emotion. That is the power of uh, cinema. I mean, you could go back. Um, it was said that when Lon the Lon Chaney version of Phantom of the Opera first uh, opened, when he got to the famous scene where the woman rips the mask off and you see the real face beneath, it was said people were out their seats, up the aisle, out the cinema, half a mile down the road before they drew breath. Such was the terror which they felt. You can't match this on a small screen. You can't begin to match it on a small screen. So cinema is important. It's an important social experience. And for that reason, we as Marxists uh, should be interested in it. I mean, Marx himself has always had an interest in art, as in all things human. But cinema's role as a mass art form, woven deep into society, particularly working class society, makes it of particular importance for Marxists. That is why we're having this discussion. Right, let's consider a couple of hurdles you're going to have to jump over here. The first, let's face it, the left are incredibly snooty when it comes to cinema. They really are. They often tend to follow the academic line, avoid talking about uh, mass entertainment. Um, they, they often look 
at just at the uh, that layer of art film which exists uh, at the top. Not helped by the fact, of course, there's very little on classic text to draw on, unlike, say, for example, economics or uh, historical materialism or something like that. You know, Marx and Engels didn't have a cinema to go to. Uh, Lenin and Trotsky did live through the early age of uh, cinema, but they frankly had more important things to worry about. <laughs> uh, Lenin did know about the film trains that were travelling around Russia, telling people about the Bolshevik Revolution and how society was changing, but again, you know, he, he couldn't spend that much time thinking about it for obvious reasons. Trotsky wrote a hell of a lot about uh, art and literature. You can buy a book downstairs, uh, I hope, on that. But for obvious reasons, he, he also couldn't think much about film. You know, he's running for his life for the last two decades of his, of his existence. So we pretty much have to make our own way uh, on this. The other problem we have to face is the, is the dominance of academic twaddle in film criticism. I'm being, I'm being quite kind here. Even left film criticism, to be honest. Postmodernism lurks in film criticism, a bit like the uh, the uh, alien lurks in John Hurt's uh, stomach in, in 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 Alien. You pick up you pick up film. I, I was going to bring some horrific examples along just to frighten the life out of you, but you pick up any sort of like. Um, sight and sound-ish sort of uh, film criticism and it'll all be there concentration on the surface looking at technique not content literally uh, take, picking up on the saying that the medium is the message all just completely surface structured well we say the message is the message substance is not important and you know in, in that sense it's even actually shaped the very art films you watch uh, to, today um, for example, a couple of years ago, a film called The Assassin came out. The critics loved it. Sight and Sound made it its film of the year, even though it hadn't actually opened yet. <laughs> Amazing. Anyway, the film did open, and a couple of weeks later, there was this review of how films are going, and they noted The Assassin wasn't doing very well. OK, it's, it's a three-hour film from China, you know, but it's about martial arts. Surely people would be rushing to see it. And they said, well... It, it has a lot of amazing techniques on it. Maybe people were put off by the fact it didn't have a plot. <laughs> it didn't have a plot, really. And then there's a new film which is coming out. I think it's called Titane. I haven't got the exact uh, pronunciation of it. Again, the critics are loving it. Cannes Film Festival loving it. They're whipping it up. You're going to have to see this film. Three hours long, of course, when it uh, comes out. What's it about? It's about a woman, young girl, who gets pregnant after having sex with a car. <laughs> and then for the next hour, when she's not mechanically rearranging her face, becomes a serial killer. Really? <laughs> this, is, this, is, um, this is what passes for uh, artistic film. Somebody's rogered by a Renault and heads off to become a serial killer for three hours. And they think this somehow has something to say to us. And don't get me started on bait. I don't know if anyone's ever seen that film. Suffice to say, me and my brother went to the BFI to see something else. And they had a trailer for bait. And he was convinced it was a comedy and started laughing. So, uh, and everyone was looking at him, and I said, oh, I was, no, actually, I think this is a serious British film, you know, about people who have become profoundly disturbed by fish, you know, and stuff like that. This is the way that art film have, has gone. It's like it's, it's adopted to see the philosophy of postmodernism and all its uh, linked ideas to shape a whole art form. When you consider the great films of Truffaut, Fellini, Antonioni, and so on, you know, which has shown how film can directly reflect life and, and say something with great skill, then it really makes you uh, weep. The final hurdle you have to think about, and I'm wary of time here, is that film history itself is becoming lost. Not just in a physical sense, and a huge number of films have been lost. Not just from the silent era, but even from the 30s and, and 40s. Apparently, sort of like 15 films of Powell and Pressburger cannot be found anymore. You know, and, and even 60s and 70s films have just uh, disappeared. So, the general understanding of film history is fading away. 
to a certain extent, at least among people who are prepared uh, to study it. So that these are all problems and things you have to be aware of when you're approaching film from a Marxist perspective. So what do we have to say about film and what does film have to say about us? Just in passing, I'm, I'm going to jump over this actually, because um, we're almost uh, halfway through, more than halfway through. Um, we don't, ex I am, have big issues with the auteur theory. Um, I think it's completely wrong, this idea that film is controlled and shaped by one powerful individual with a single vision who does everything apparently. Film is a collaborative experience, enormous uniquely amongst uh, art that involves not just uh, directors, but producers, cameramen, editors, clothing, actors, of course, you know, and so on and so on and so on. You sit through the credits, the end of a film, there are hundreds, perhaps thousands of people working uh, on a film. So this idea that it's, it's elitist, actually, that one person can, is, is responsible for everything is uh, completely wrong. That doesn't mean, by the way, I won't be referring to directors um, when I link to film, just for convenience sake, but just bear that in, uh, in mind. So, look, dealing with the vastness of the subject, in fact, I'm almost halfway through the time allotted anyway, I am. I, I cannot deal with all the isms, waves, trends, genres, high points, low points, etc., which has existed in film history. I cannot deal with the rich reservoir of counterculture underground film. One exception, which I'll come on to later. I certainly I cannot even deal with the Soviet cinema or, um, you know, or even that in the important strand of left films that somehow got through the establishment net. So what can I deal with? Very little. I just want to throw up a few issues for you lot to think about, in, perhaps in the discussion. Art form versus commodity. Now, Marx was interested in art because it exposed the special characteristic of commodity production under capitalism, the requirement to envisage an item before it became real. Marx talked a lot about the special role of an architect, for example. He wanted us to understand that we were more than just machines. We create, abstract, visualize. Animals just uh, do things for immediate need. We go beyond that. That's what differentiates us. But this creativity, this desire to create, actually, which exists in all of us, comes up against the requirements of a class society and the need for capitalism to produce commodities for product. To realise the surplus value created the sweat of one class for the benefit of a rich few. So our creativity is constantly being used, but also crushed at exactly the same time. And film production, remember the word production? Is, is, uh, is no different. Cinema today is dominated by the money banks of Hollywood, and Hollywood is dominated by a rich, powerful cartel of the likes of Universal, Warner, Columbia, Sony and Fox. You may see lots of other company names on film credits, but most of those are subsidiaries of these big firms. Um, others are, are finance representatives, a lot of Chinese companies, because Hollywood is desperate for Chinese finance and also to get into the Chinese market. So uh, that's a factor. And of course, behind all this, you also now got Netflix and Amazon lurking around in the wings, trying to get in. They've been rejected, but the money is money is money. These film companies are owned by financial interests, not by film fans who want one thing, profit. So production, the film production today is increasingly being shaped from need for guaranteed return on investment. So you've got, you get endless remakes, sequels and films that look like 100 others. You've already watched this film, I'm sure you have. Um, for example, action films. They all have the same character in. Have you noticed? There'll be a bloke in his 30s, maybe he's separated from his wife, but he's got a little daughter who he loves, or something like that. He might have a beard, unless he's Mike Damon, which he hasn't. But he is a loner who plays by his own rules. And how many times have we seen these characters? He'll set you straight, don't you worry. Of course, you'll come up against all manner of villainous Chinese and Russians or North Koreans or Arabs. And now, of course, you have to add Venezuelans to 
Andy. Yes, who 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 will befuddle the rest of the system, but not our not our uh, hero, who by the way would ready to survive an extraordinary beating over the hour and a half or two hours of the film. He'd be blown up, thrown through windows, shot. But it doesn't matter. It was at the end. Uh, people weep. You're getting the last of plastic, and it'll all be fine. <laughs> These films actually even look the same. Have you noticed that strange orangey blue effect you see in action films? It's called teal. They tint the films because they think this is the best, best way for the films uh, to look. They use algorithms to calculate how films should be edited and what scenes should follow on from another. Literally, we're at a point when these sort of films are as close to computer games as you can get. Resident Evil, anyone? <laughs> <laughs> of course, the trick then is to produce the maximum product itself and the minimum cost. And, beyond, and Hollywood plays on the fact that people are desperate to get into the fil into film, to exploit them every which way they can. Low pay, long hours, poor working conditions, and so on. And here I do want to say a word about the recent death of cinematographer Helena Hutchings, who, as I'm sure you know, was, uh, was killed just over a week ago. A very promising young cinematographer whose life was cut short just as her career was taking off. Why? This death was completely avoidable. It was completely down to cost cutting, which these film companies, in order to gain maximum profit, set about uh, doing. The guns, we used real guns because real guns in Texas and wherever are, are much cheaper. They didn't check, they were properly prepared. This is not the first accident, this is the way this happened. The set itself was considered so dangerous that Union people had already walked off, uh, and yet nothing uh, was done. These are Victorian st uh, style exploitation we're seeing here. We also shouldn't forget the Me Too movement, which came out. What a surprise! Women are exploited in Hollywood. <laughs> They've been exploited for the last hundred years, the so called casting couch, couch and so on, used by uh, people who, are, who see that people are desperate for a way out of their, their miserable lives by getting into cinema. And yet nothing has ever been done. The casting couch was no secret. And yet, enough Hollywood, who's blubbering away now about the Me Too movement, have done absolutely uh, nothing. Of course, this doesn't mean that Hollywood doesn't occasionally allow move interesting and exciting films to get through. Let's be fair about it. Between 1968 and 74, as, as the youth movement got underway, there was a, Hollywood started throwing money at all manner of uh, mavericks and people like that. Arthur Penn, Mike Nichols, Robert Altman, Sam Peckinpah suddenly had all the funding they, could, they needed to make all the films uh, uh, they could make. Even John Cassavetes actually got some funding, you know, after years of having to constantly mortgage his house to make his, uh, his very low budget uh, films. In Britain, people like John Borgman and Nick Rogue were able to find uh, a place. But the ultimate expression of this was the funding Hollywood's desire to fund a follow-up to Last Tango in Paris by Bernardo Bertolucci. He had promised an historical epic, epic to be called Novecento or 1900. Fox, United Artists, Paramount all put loads of money in and they enabled the film to have a huge cast but Lancaster, Sterling Hayden, Donald Sutherland, Robert De Niro, Gerard Depardieu, Dominique Sander, on and on and on. A massive budget because they thought Last Tango in Paris made a mint. This one's bound to make a mint. They thought that up until the first six-hour print was screened <laughs> in, uh, in Italy. It was private showing. Paramount boss got a phone call. Hey! You've just, we've just funded a six-hour Marxist epic. <laughs> what? As a result, this film has never been seen in its full form. The Americans got a three-hour version. I saw a, a four-hour plus two-part version in London in 1978. Uh, the version of DVD today is, is the five-hour, 15-minute version. It's about the longest you're ever going to see. By the end of the 1970s, all that spending was gone. These visionary filmmakers were either scrabbling around for work or had drifted into the mainstream to make normal, boring uh, films. Better, Lucci never really made another decent film. John Cassavetes was back to making uh, cheap films and mortgaging his uh, house. Profits first, originality second. That 
is the nature of the film production. Now, I did want to talk a little bit, but I'm going to have to cut over it, the question of film as propaganda. I think it's important to understand that because film has this huge impact on people, the ruling class have been able to use it, although sometimes it's been used against them, to shape ideas and views. For example, when have you ever seen a sympathetic view of a trade union in a film? And in the 1940s and 50s, they produced films which were overt the uh, propagandistic films about the communist threat to all of us. But they also had these films which were kind of like covert versions in which the, the enemy wasn't the communists, but it was the other aliens from outer space, monsters from the deep, giant ants, so on and so forth, which shaped a fear, you know, that we are under, America is under attack. We have to be on our guard. Um, there's a film called Invasion of the Body Snatchers, the original Don Siegel film. In my opinion, it can only be seen as a warning. He said, he said it was a warning against conformity, and later remakes did go along with that. But how else can you interpret a film in which apparently these pods have been brought into a small American town and are turning small American apple pie making mums into people who look the same but have no emotions, no religion, no lack of uh, conformity and so forth. That is isn't a covert, perhaps not so covert, message about, the war, about communism. They're actually... The state has always been very keen to ensure that films do not drift away into territories they don't much prefer. Um, I have here some, in, some excerpts from the guidelines of the British Board of Film Censors, uh, 1916, when you know, people have become worried about films that are being produced, they set up the British Board of Film Censors, now the British Board of Film Classification, and... Um, they produce some guidelines. Now, you, you probably think this is all about no sex, no brutality, no funny business of animals or anything like that. Ah, listen to this. Here's the things they don't tell you about. Films that should also be banned. References to controversial politics. <laughs> Relations of capital and labour. <laughs> Scenes tending to disparage public characters and institutions. Realistic horrors of warfare. I don't want to see that. <laughs> Instance, incidents having a tendency to disparage our allies. Scenes holding up the king's uniform to contempt or ridicule. And this is my favourite. Subjects dealing with India. Attempting to suggest a disloyalty of British officers, native states, or bringing into disrepute British prestige in the empire. <laughs> Does this require any further comment? Needless to say, one of the first films to be banned under this was Battleship Potemkin. The point is... In the absence of any alternative, the dominant ideas of any society, the dominant ideas of the ruling class. Film can affect that. That is why film, unlike any other art form, has been, has been subject to huge uh, censorship and control because it can be used to shape what we think about. Some filmmakers are able to flip it, but uh, that unfortunately is still an exception. Now, in the last couple of minutes, I just want to say something else about film, so I think it's important. We don't look at film just as the thing in itself, which is what film criticism does. It analyzes the film, perhaps in relation to other films by the same director or whatever, or maybe other examples of the same genre. But as a rule, they, they look at film as if it's was produced completely in a separate universe to the one we live in. But we understand that film can reveal much about society. I mean, in the future, it's been said, people, when they want to know how we live today, they'll look at our films, which will, I think will come as a bit of a shock to watch some of the films. You know, I think, did we really do that? You know, uh, <laughs> were we really fighting Russian invasion all the time? Like that? But it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Obviously, there are exceptions. 
films of Ken Loach and Stephen Queen, for example, are great. But some of these films, when you look at them, it's only by looking at them in the context of society which produced them, the times and the age, that you can really gain an understanding. For example, Three Days of a Condor, which I think is one of the best films of the 1970s, because it's one of the best films to show up what was happening in the 1970s America. You can see the, the oil crisis, Watergate revolution, uh, revelations about, uh, uh, and the CIA, uh, a general feeling that things weren't right. All that is reflected in Three Days of the uh, Condor. Alan Pakula's Parallax View also uh, taps into I recommend uh, both films. So by looking at it this way, you gain an understanding of much, much more. And the film itself becomes far more relevant. We need to look beyond the surface. Now, if I had time and I haven't, I would like to, I'll give you a couple of examples. How this plays out. I'll just give one very briefly. Everyone's heard of film noir. I hope everyone's heard of film noir. A hugely influential genre of film criticism in the 1940s and 50s. Now, no one set out in 1939 to say, hey, let's, create a new, let's do a different style. Let's do a film noir. Now, that, that name was applied much later by critics. And why was it called film noir? No one spoke French in it. <laughs> it's because they felt these films had a foreign style to them. They should really have actually called it German noir, I suppose, but French seemed easier. Something a far away, something un-American. American filmmakers couldn't have made this. It had to be influenced from abroad. The French, of course, had no tradition of film noir to much, much later with Jean-Pierre Melville and people like that who copied it because they thought it was an American genre. But, but film noir was approached because, like in this manner, because it seemed to reveal an alternative to the American dream. If you watch mainstream cinema of the 40s and 50s, you see the American dream, the, su the suburban, shiny, happy, smiling people, you know, uh, Brad and Mary Lou, their two sons and uh, their daughter and all, and all the rest of it, enjoying a happy life working for the corporation. Nothing can go wrong, nothing can, be, nothing can break away from this idyllic world. Film noir looks at the American dream and presents the American nightmare, a world of corruption, a world of poverty, a world of union and unrest, a world of, uh, of bribery, of, of, uh, of mental illness, of drug addiction, of all these things which weren't supposed to exist in America, but actually did exist. A world of racism, for uh, example, Odds Against Tomorrow, a late, a late example from 1959, is one of the boldest films to pick up on the issue of American racism, which didn't, didn't, apparently didn't exist uh, anywhere else. There are two examples I just briefly want to touch on as to how this, I think we should all try and see. Uh, 1942 film, This Gun for Hire, is Anna Ladd's big breakout film. Ladd plays a real anti-hero. He's a contract killer, and he's capable of really dark uh, deeds, to be honest. At one point, he's contemplating killing a young crippled girl because she might have been a witness to a hit he's just carried out. And he's really thinking about it. Shall I get him a gun out and shoot her? And he doesn't. But he's also extremely kind and very moral. The point is that Raven, in his... Uh, descent into disaster comes up against something far worse, the capitalist system. And that's what this film presents. The real villain is a capitalist who has no morals, uh, is purely in it for profit, wants to sell uh, an, an important weapon to the enemy just to make money. He doesn't think, you know, this is un-American. Uh, and this is quite common, by the way. And, and it's this which Raven ultimately uh, rebels uh, against. Another interesting film is Force of Evil. I've written about this once already. Uh, Abraham Polonsky's film from 1948, which has been called the most anti-capitalist film ever made. And it starts with John Garfield, somebody called Joe Morse, who, who, who does this uh, voiceover. Very first scene. This is Wall Street, and today was important because tomorrow, July the 4th, I intend to make my first million do dollars. The fact this has been... 
said over an image of Wall Street gives the thing away. The film directly links the method of the crime organisation which Morse is increasingly involved in uh, with the methods and practices of big business. In fact, actually, it's all do this numbers racket. Um, the local collection points are called banks. You can't miss the uh, line uh, uh, on this. And the whole purpose of Morse's scam is to get these banks merged together into one big bank under his control. Is this not capitalism? Of course, none of this was, went unnoticed. Uh, Polonsky and quite a few of the other people who have worked in film noir um, were promptly put on the blacklist and didn't make another, he didn't make another film until uh, 1970. So by studying these films, which are presented as simple thrillers, you start to gain an understanding of what was happening in American society. And this is the approach you should adopt in relation to all of them. Not to take it to ridiculous lengths. You know, you're not going to sit there watching the evil dead and trying to work out what it tells us about 90s, 90s Britain or something like that. But you can draw a lot about why these films, how these films function within society and therefore gain an understanding of that. So to finish um, my remarks, big business controls the world media, including cinema. Now, we could seek to undermine it, as many filmmakers have attempted to, but in reality, Hollywood holds purse strings. The power of film, which I imagine is why you're all here, needs to be opened up, no longer constrained by the iron heel of profit. This incredible, dynamic, modern, revolutionary form of art is capable of so much more. You know, the, the rich cinema, even now, with home viewing and streaming becoming the norm, is still quite extraordinary and quite quite unique. Yet what are we stuck with? Fast and Furious 327 of a 900 remake of, of, of Halloween. The nationalisation of the means of production to worker control must include not only factories and banks, but also the bosses' media. Remember, it is the bosses' media, including film production. Making this huge recreative resource available to all will present us with a new renaissance of, of, of the arts and show us actually what we are all capable of. You know, when, when we've got the time to do it, to open, turn ourselves from tools of a capitalist class into creative, collective human beings in a society freed from class oppression and exploitation. That is the cinema I'm waiting to see. Thank you, comrades.